real estate crash. There might be no more divisive subject out there right now than is real estate going to, um, let's call it crash or go down in a substantial way over the next year or not. And there's definitely, you have some folks like Dave Ramsey on one side that say, no, there's not going to be a real estate crash. And there's actually many other people that feel like that as well. Like, no, we're not going to have any sort of major real estate downside. And then you have others like the gentleman uh, I'm going to show you here today in this video, Reventure Consulting, that's definitely on the side of a lot of pain ahead, okay? Now, I believe there's definitely pain ahead in real estate, and we got some shocking data to kind of show you in today's video. It's very troubling, and um, I think I'm, I'm so bearish on real estate for 2023, it's not even funny, to be quite frank. Everything is going to work against this baby, and um, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I think that's an important thing for everybody to understand. You know, I, I went into this year, and I said I would not buy real estate in 2022. Honestly, as we get closer to 2023, I'm probably going to feel the same exact way. Don't buy real estate in 2023. And um, I'm usually somebody that likes real estate. I own three homes myself, and uh, I think it's a great place to park money and usually make money. But unfortunately, um, we had a very bloated market with interest rates and everything that, that happened there and transpired that caused prices to go to ridiculous levels. Let's call it like that was so unnatural what happened to real estate prices. And the hotter the city is, the more I'm scared. So cities like I have homes in Las Vegas and Phoenix. Those are ones I definitely have major concerns in, to be quite honest. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this. Hope you guys enjoy this. as always. Thank you everybody that subscribed to the channel. 17,700 subscribers. Thank you to everybody that watches when I do a real estate re uh, you know, video, reaction video, because I don't do that many. And usually when I do a real estate reaction video, it usually doesn't do very good views. So I appreciate uh, the folks that do watch these videos. And um, yeah, make sure you check out uh, this gentleman's channel. Inventory on the US housing market is exploding right now as we see more and more homes sitting empty with big, big price cuts. Data I just pulled from Zillow shows that the number of for sale inventory properties has gone up over 60% in the last several months while the number of four rent property look at that wow 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 <laughs> you know just inventory skyrocketing absolutely skyrocketing whether we're talking for sale or for rent that is a uh whoa that the, the, the anybody that looks at that i think should definitely at least it should concern you a little bit, regardless if you're bullish or bearish on, on real estate. I think that it should be something that you're like, oh my gosh, man. Rents, you know, in terms of amount of properties for rent and uh, in terms of amount of properties for sale is, is skyrocketing. We haven't even seen, we haven't even seen any, you know, major unemployment go up or anything like that yet. And yet you're seeing this play out. Holy smoke, is that ain't no joke. It's also gone up by 60%, indicating that we're in a double barreled housing crash that's an absolute nightmare for real estate investors right now. We are seeing investors, particularly these big corporate Wall Street investors, absolutely freak out. They're panicking, they're fire sailing much of their portfolio. This higher inventory is leading to decline. So something very, very important, you know, I don't know how up to date people are in the real estate sector, but let me explain this because this is extremely important. One of the scarier things that's come into the real estate market over the last few years that wasn't there 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is these big funds in corporations that would buy up tons and tons of homes, right? Now they're going to say, oh, we're only this, uh, this much as a percent of, of the outstanding homes out there. And it's like, okay, but you guys might actually at a particular time be buying up 10% of the inventory, 20% of the inventory. There was sometimes when these, these, these companies were buying up almost entire neighborhoods because they were flush with cash. They could take out any amount of money they wanted at very cheap rates. And so they would buy up mass amounts of homes, right? Now, as the real estate market gets worse and worse, because remember, the real estate market is just starting to enter pain. The real estate market lags the stock market in a major, major way. So the real estate market just started to enter pain over the past three to six months. And it's going to get a lot worse. We've got a long way to go in this baby. And with these corporations in here, that's the that's the wild card on what happens when debt starts coming due, what happens when properties start going under in terms of like what the property is supposed to be worth. It's, it's now also worth less than what a company bought it at, which is things going to happen to much of these companies' inventory because they bought at crazy pricing in 2020, 2021, and at the beginning of this year, the first few months of this year in 2022. 
I think that that's gonna that's the wild card in this market that we've never actually seen in uh, past real estate problems. And the real estate market, unfortunately, is starting to move more and more like the stock market with these giant fluctuations up and down prices and declining rents. And I believe that this investor fire sale is going to be a subprime crisis 2.0 in terms That's of a, its impact on the housing market. We're going to see this inventory prediction. go up, not just for the short term, but for the long term. There is going to be a perpetual flood of homes coming onto the market and sitting empty, much like there was in 2008, 2009. Now, back then, 15 years ago, during that last housing crash, it was about foreclosures and the big surge in foreclosures led to lots of new inventory. But today, it's going to be a little bit different. Yes, we're going to have the foreclosures, but the big surge in inventory is mainly going to come from investors dumping their properties because right now depending on the source there's anywhere between 20 to 30 million investor owned homes in the u.s housing market and if only five percent of those investors sell say because the value of their property is declining say because the rent that they're getting is declining say because they can't find a tenant to rent their property to that would dump 1.3 million homes onto the US housing market for sale, which would double the amount of inventory and lead to a complete collapse in prices. Now, it's very important out there, if you're a home buyer or a real estate investor wanting to take advantage of this corporate fire sale in the buildup of inventory, you gotta understand, it's gonna occur in certain cities more than others. In particular, it's gonna occur in cities that meet three main criteria. Number one is a lot of investor activity. Cities like Phoenix and Atlanta and Dallas and Charlotte and Jacksonville have had nearly one third of the homes being purchased by an investor. So if you've had wow. a lot of investors- One third of the homes being purchased by investors, okay? Now, something he, he brought up there that's a very important point, okay, is he talks about all these investors in these different markets, right? And if they can't rent out a property, because uh, you know there's just too many properties to rent right and there's not enough people to to rent those properties then you could be stuck in a situation where those folks go ahead and try to list those homes but here's a problem good luck selling a home especially in some of the markets that already went hot because i can tell you in, in you know cities like i know really well vegas phoenix markets like that it's become really difficult especially at any sort of upper price brackets to sell a property and why is this well interest rates are now, you know, for a 30 year mortgage is, you know, high sixes, even sevens we've been touching on recently. And I, I did a, a reaction video, uh, uh, probably last week or the week before where we were talking about a, a gentleman in reacting to his opinion that he thought interest rates are going to 10% by February for the, for a 30 year mortgage. Okay. <laughs> no one's going to be buying homes out there if we're, we got 30 years at 10% at or whatever. That's just ridiculous. So we're in a very bad dynamic from the interest rate side on, on 30 year mortgages at this point in time. And, and just who can either who can afford it or who wants to buy a home at a 7%, 8%, 9% or 10% type interest rate. Like that's just insanity, right? To three years, you're going to have an even bigger fire sale as this housing crash gets worse. But number two, it's also going to be markets with a lot of home building that have this inventory deluge because these builders, as I've said in previous videos, they're going crazy right now, building a record amount of homes and apartments in many of the same cities, actually, that the investors are buying in. So these investors and these builders, they're basically teaming up to crash these housing markets. And they're not doing it intentionally. They're just doing it because they all decided to allocate their capital to the same exact cities and the same exact neighborhoods over the last two years. Now, this is the inevitable result of all of that capital flooding into these housing markets. Yeah, it caused prices to go up on the way up, but it's going to cause the crash to be even worse on the way down. And think about it like this. It's similar to like a faucet and you had the faucet running full go, right? He, here's all the cheap money you want. You want a 2% mortgage? Here it is. Oh, corporations. So you guys can go buy a bunch of, of properties. Oh, real estate investors. Here's all this cheap money out there, right? The faucet's full go. And then in a matter of months, the faucet's gone completely off now. And now it's like, oh yeah, go, go buy a home right now and pay 7%. As a corporation, Good luck trying to raise money right now to go buy a bunch of homes. Good luck with that. We're in a, we're, we shut the faucet off now at this point in time. So what do you think is going to happen in 2023 when you shut the faucet off? Unless you t turn that baby back on at some point in 2023, it's going to get very, very bad. And so the only thing that honestly can save the housing market is if the faucet gets turned back on full go again, which then you lead into a bunch of other potential problems with inflation, things like that. If all of a sudden we, we, 
take 30 year mortgages back down two, 3%. Okay. Then we can talk again. But when you go from, you know, all this cheap money in two to 3% to 7% and potentially higher than that in 2023, we'll see where things shake out there. Right. That's where you get into a, a real, let's just call it pickle. Okay. Real pickle. I've been really harping on the last couple of weeks. Everyone is not just a surge in for sale inventory and declining prices, but the surge in rental inventory and declining rents. This is what has me most excited right now uh, for you guys out there hoping for a cheaper home is that the rents are now starting to go down and the rental inventory is just going off. Let me tell you a very personal story. Uh, this guy right here, I have three homes and one of them, uh, two of them are just basically like extra homes. One of them's, and by the way, do you think I'm the only person in the United States of America that just has extra homes? I don't think so. What, what do people that just have extra homes? Sometimes it's for vacation homes. Sometimes it's just a place to park money. That's the way I look at it. Homes usually appreciate, so I just park money there, right? So I have three homes, right? One of my homes, which is in Vegas, I try to sell that home. And I even put it at competitive pricing. I staged the home, had the best company out there represent it. Couldn't sell it. Couldn't sell it. I'm sure I could have fire sailed at some just ridiculous price, but I couldn't sell it for even close to what I wanted to sell it for. And that number was $150,000 lower than what it was previously supposed to sell at like six months prior to that. Okay. So what am I doing now? I'm going to rent that home. What am I going to rent that home for? Fair market value? Nope. I'm undercutting everybody. Undercutting everybody. Why am I going to do that? Because I know it's going to be hard to even, if I undercut, it's still going to be hard to rent that baby. Okay. So do you think I'm the only person in, in America that just has extra homes laying around? Do you think I'm the only one that's thinking I need to get out in front of this and start undercutting? So what do you think is going to happen in the real estate market? People are going to start undercutting when they go to sell a home because now the reality is stepping in like, oh crap, my home's not worth what it used to be. If I'm going to sell this home, I need to sell it at way less than what it was priced at. Real estate agents are going to be starving out there. Real estate agents and brokers, mo many of them are going to be starving for the next year. And so what are they going to tell their clients? Dude, we've got to, we've got to come in extremely competitively priced. I know you're not going to like this. I know that, you know, your home used to be valued a lot more a year ago, but if we want a chance to sell this, we need to come in way under what you're thinking. That's what real estate agents are going to have to do. And these folks are going to have to start doing right. And the clients are going to have to wake up to that reality of just Gosh, you know, I remember I looked on Zillow when the Zestimate said this a year ago, and now you're telling me I got to sell it for this. This is 20% less. This is 25% less. This is 30% less. It's what's going to have to happen. And the ones that are, you know, actually move pricing down in a major way have a chance to rent that property, have a chance to sell that property in 2023. The ones that don't, it will sit out there. It's just more and more buildup of inventory. And then eventually what people get caught up into is they have to move it. So then they have to finally come to the realization and drop that price, or they're going to realize they're just wasting their time on market. Sure. It's up 60% over the last five months. And if we look on Zillow here in different counties around America, you could just see huge number of vacant oh, rentals yeah. sitting empty with landlords doing big, big price cuts. And what wow. are the markets where this rental inventory of see that again. rentals sitting empty with landlords doing big, big. Yeah. That's what you're going to see. Uh, look at this, you know, price cut, price cut, price cut. That's exactly, that is exactly what you're going to see across many of the United States markets and especially all the hot ones is whether people are trying to sell a house or trying to rent a house, cut, 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 cut. That's what you're going to see continually. Price cuts. And what are the markets where this rental inventory of homes and townhomes is building the most? Well, according to the data I pulled from Zillow, King County in Seattle is number one. Rental inventory has gone up wow. 135% over the last five months. Wow. So Detroit is number two. Dallas yes. is number three. Miami is number four. And Contra Costa County in San Francisco is number five. Wow. Look at those moves there. My gosh. I mean, inventory is up 90, 100 percent. Now, do, do keep in mind, inventory was, you know, historically very low at the same time last year. So there's definitely some catching up to do. But I mean, 90 percent, 100 percent catching up. Wow. That, that's some startling numbers. And, and here's a here's a here's the most interesting part of this is it's not done. 
It's not done. Inventory is going to keep rising for at least probably, I would say, six months. But you're probably looking at 12 months of, of rising inventory when it comes to these rentals. Whew. And largely, you can see on this list of rental inventory gainers, it's a lot of Sunbelt markets as we head further down this list. So I would expect cheaper rents in those markets going forward, as well as a lot of investors fire sailing homes in those markets. Because if the investors can't rent out their property, well, they have no reason to hold their property, especially in a declining price and rising interest rate environment. Sure. Now, what really actually intrigues me though, folks, is not just the markets with higher rental inventory, it's the ones also with higher for sale inventory, that double barreled housing crash I've been talking about a lot. What are the cities most in the crosshairs of this double barreled crash where the inventory is surging on both accounts? Well, let's take a look at this scatter plot and find out. It's the counties in the top right of this graph like Collin County in Dallas. Over the last five months, rental inventory is up 124% while sale inventory is up 97%. It's Gwinnett County in Atlanta, where for sale inventory has almost tripled and rental inventory has doubled. It's Hillsborough County in Tampa, where there's been an 84% increase in rental inventory and a 96% increase in sale inventory. And what's scary about this double-barreled housing crash- Before we get into his scariness, listen to my scariness, okay? Interest rates have gone insane. Obviously, housing prices have gone insane. They need to come down majorly, right? Consumer confidence in terms of Michigan consumer confidence that's been done for decades and decades and decades. We've seen around the lowest numbers over the past uh, few months. You want to know some more scary data? Most folks in the middle class are worse off financially right now than they were a year ago. Most. So confidence low. People are doing worse. Interest rates have gone to the moon. What do you think has to happen? <laughs> Prices has to, and, and inventories piling up to the sky, and it's not gonna, it's not done. It's going to pile up a whole lot more over the next six to twelve months. So, what do you think is going to have to happen? Rents are going to have to come down in a substantial way. And obviously, uh, home prices are going to have to come down in a substantial way, not a small way, a substantial way. These in other parts of America is that we've never really experienced this in the US housing market before. Like we had a for sale bubble in 0607 that was a for sale crash for over the next five years, but we didn't actually have a rental bubble back then and we didn't have nearly as many investors in the market. So this is uncharted territory. No one really knows for sure how the housing market is gonna to react to this with the 20 to 30 million investors owning at a time when both prices and rents are going down. My prediction is that this is gonna be historic. This is gonna be something on par with 2007, perhaps worse. Because the way you got to think on about- On par with 2000, the 2007 through 2011 crash. And he says, um, potentially even worse. He said, potentially even worse. So my view on that is, I don't know if I'll quite, if I'm quite as bearish as him on housing, I'm pretty darn bearish to be honest. And I think I'm much more bearish than most, but I wouldn't quite put myself to quite his extent. Um, you know, that's a big prediction. And if he's right on that, holy smokers, that would be uh, devastating to the overall U.S. economy. The best thing, I always say this, and I think it's very important for everybody watching this to understand this. The best thing that ever happens to the U.S. economy, the best thing, is a new home being built. There's nothing ever better. The reason being is massive amounts of workers have to work on that project. So it creates tons of jobs. Like you don't understand how many jobs go into building a house. It's ridiculous. The amount of people that just work on actual physical structure of the house, it can be between 50 and 100 different trades basically take take part in building that house at some point in time between 50 and 100 different trades okay and, and individuals that come in then you got all the people that are doing all the paperwork and the city people and the state people right then you got all the companies that guess what are making the products that go into that home in, in factory somewhere whether you're talking about the tv or the fireplace or the chandelier or the air vent over there or the windows over here or the flooring right there and all the furniture companies that make the tables and the chairs and all that stuff right the best thing that ever happens to the U.S. economy is a new home being built. We know, we've seen this. You're going to hurt the U.S. economy in a massive, massive way if you kill real estate. And I think we're at real jeopardy of killing real estate in 2023. And I don't think anybody really understands what that means, I, including the Fed, to be quite honest, right? They, they, they definitely have the understanding of we screwed up and we got to definitely get inflation down, right? But there's a huge cost that, that happens if you're going to talk about killing new homes being built. 
which there's going to be no new homes being built past 2023 if if you can't even sell a home or if rents just keep dropping and home prices keep dropping because then if there is anybody in the market they're going to say why would it go build a new home right now it's probably overpriced when i could just buy this home that you know is 25 percent less than what it was valued in the past or 30 percent or whatever right so that's that's a very important dynamic that's out there that I think um, you know everybody should pay attention to. And if you if you kill new home construction, you kill the economy. That's just the bottom line. There's just the amount of jobs that are, that are created when a new home's built is ridiculous, right? Never mind that. Never mind that. And I brought this out in a video recently when I was it was a stock market related video I was doing, and I was talking about Home Depot and Lowe's are going to be in trouble in my opinion in 23. And the reason being is you're going to start to in kill the real estate industry, right? And Lowe's and Home Depot have benefited massively over the last few years of the real estate market booming, people feeling like I'm going to go spend money on my home, whether it's buy a new refrigerator, whether it's, you know, get some new paint for the house or get a new floor or, or do a project in the backyard, whatever it is. They've done that mainly because they felt like it's an investment because my home keeps going up in value. It's an investment, right? Plus they benefited from all these Folks that are obviously in the the rental market, right? They have to fix up the homes and put all this money into it. They got the the home flippers that were a huge segment of the, of the market, obviously in 2020, all the way up until early 2022. And um, I just don't see that being in a good spot in 2023 and beyond for a bit there, right? And so. I think eventually that's going to hit Home Depot numbers and that will hit Lowe's numbers in a pretty substantial way um, in 2023. It's just a, a ticking time bomb there. This everyone is that the more speculative owners there are in the housing market, and by speculative owners, I mean people who own homes but don't live in the homes like an investor. Well, that just creates the potential for way more volatility in terms of inventory, in terms of prices, because if you don't live in the house that you own, it's going to be a much easier process for you to sell that house. Because after all, you just are treating that property as an investment vehicle, a profit generating tool. So when the profit runs out, like when prices go down and when rents go down, there's no point in you owning as an investor anymore. And this is why we're going to see this big investor sell off over the next couple of years, which is going to be kind of hard for people to wrap their head around it first. You know, I think people are going to kind of struggle with understanding how so much inventory is going to be coming onto the U.S. housing market over the next couple of years. They're going to say, well, where did this inventory come from? Well, folks, it was always there. The inventory was always there in the background because it was houses that were owned by people who didn't live there. So all it would take is a housing crash, a recession, a downturn in the rental market to trigger all that inventory being put up for sale and for rent. But it's important to understand we are in the beginning stages of this. We are just now seeing the shadow inventory in the vacant homes come out of the woodwork. We're going to see more and more of this into the future, especially as the recession gets worse, everyone. Because right now, the unemployment rate is still at a record low. And with a record low unemployment rate, we're already seeing just a cataclysmic drop in housing demand. So what's going to happen if the unemployment rate doubles or triples? Well, housing demand, it could go down to the lowest levels in 40 or 50 years, just when home prices and rents are near all time highs and when investors are trying to sell. And it's going to be. And you think about this for a moment, right? Whenever the economy is stronger and stronger, it's going to be naturally more demand for new homes or just homes in general or a place to rent. The reason being is people start feeling better about their financial situation. People move out of, you know, situations where maybe they had roommates and then they, you know, maybe they're just a roommate at, at somebody else's house, right? And then they're like, oh, I'm doing well for myself. I got a good job. So I'm gonna go get my own apartment. I'm gonna go get my own house, whatever it is. Um, you got obviously, you know, kids that are moving out of their parents' homes and things like that, right? If the economy, if you're talking about a contracting economy, right, which there's still a big debate on if we're gonna have a major contracting economy in 2023, if you have a dynamic like that, think about it like this, like like all of a sudden people are much more likely to start moving in with each other and take demand out of the market, either because they want to, because they're in a tougher situation or because literally they have to and they have no choice. If somebody loses their job and they can't get another job, what happens is they move in with other folks, right? Um, plus you have the, obviously the baby boomer generation that is aging. And if there's a tough economic environment, then folks that are, are, you know, the children of baby boomers, they might be more likely to say, hey, mom and dad, why don't you go sell that house and, and move in with us? You know, we need help paying the bills over here and we can all benefit each other. 
you know, things like that happen. We saw that play out in, in obviously, 2007 through 2011, right? And so that's why the millennials, what were the millennials, like, uh, my, which is my generation, right? What were we, like, um, told? We, we were saying, oh, the millennial generation is, like, the basement generation, right? So living in their, their parents' basement for, like, you know, until they're, like, in their late 20s or something like that, right? And that's what the generation was. I moved out of my parents' house when I was uh, 20, 21 and moved to a one-bedroom apartment, right? But I can tell you, most millennials I know, they did not do that. They, they lived with their parents until they were, like, 24, 25. Some of them, uh, you know, didn't move out until their late 20s. So there was a, you know... And the reason being, it was a tougher economy at that time. It really was, right? And the millennials just kind of got, you know, a little screwed over in that situation because they started coming into the workforce at a time when, you know, the workforce wasn't wasn't in the best place, right? I, I tell examples of my first few jobs. It was take what you can get, making seven fifty an hour, cleaning dishes at Einstein Bagels, or working at Walgreens, making eight something an hour, right? Because that's what you could get at that time. You know, the, I had at Walgreens, you know, in 2008, 2009, 2010, I had managers of the stores that held college degrees. These people were assistant managers making 34000 a year, 35000 36000 a year. They were assistant managers, but that's what they had. That's the only opportunity they really had. They tried to apply for other jobs out there, and they couldn't find anything. So they had college graduates working as assistant managers at Walgreens. But when you're in a what, contracting economy, a difficult economy, that type of stuff happens, man. It's just, it just is what it is. That's the best way to put it. It is what it is. A, a massive deluge, a, a massive liquidation. And the way to understand where your city and housing market is in this crash is to track this inventory data on the sale and rental market each and every month. Because it's telling you what's going to happen in your city and housing market over the next three to six months. And right now the message is housing crash is getting worse. Prices are going down, rents are going down. Get ready for a mass investor liquidation. Now, before signing off everyone, I wanna warn you all of housing crash deniers. Be very, very careful of these people. I'm seeing more and more housing crash deniers out there. Mr. Revencher, if you see this, okay, the camera lens is over here. You're looking at the screen, sir, when you're recording on your phone. The real estate space, I'm seeing them even in the comments to my videos sometimes. And these are people who six to 12 months ago said that the housing market would never crash. The Dave Ramseys of the world. They were saying home <laughs> prices would go up forever. Let me know in the comments, everyone, if you remember the people who were saying that six to 12 months ago. Well, now they've adjusted their argument in terms of denying the housing crash. No longer can they reject the notion of home price decline. So instead, now what they're doing, and important you don't fall victim to their methodology and psychology is they're saying oh a five to ten percent decline in austin or phoenix in four months that's nothing that's not a crash no big deal and these people would be right in saying five to ten percent on the surface isn't a big deal but in only four months that's actually a huge crash in the housing market it suggested values in austin and phoenix could go down by 25 percent over the course of a year and potentially even more over several years so what i want to key you guys in on if you're someone looking to buy a house just got to understand these value declines are just the start they're the validation that yes the housing market is crashing and they will continue to go down they will continue to get cheaper for the reasons I outlined in this. Yeah, hundred percent in agreement. You know, we're we're at the still the early innings of this game. This is a, you know, maybe we're going about to go into a second inning of this real estate down cycle. You know, uh, I'll just call it that. I'll leave it like that. Real estate down cycle. We're about to go into the second inning of this. The first inning started, where you're starting to see some massive deterioration. We're about to go into the second inning, where you're going to see the next level of deterioration, where inventories go up even more, prices have to drop even more, and then the third and fourth inning, which is in 2023. That's when even the masses start to pay attention and even media starts to pick up on this a little bit of like, Hey, have you seen what's going on in the real estate market? Like, wow. You know, right now in, in the first and second inning, no one really picks up on it. It's once it starts really hitting people's radar, it's that third and fourth inning. Right. And that's when all of a sudden people start picking up on it. Like, wow, have you seen prices are really dropping? Have you seen how hard it is to sell a house, to rent a house and, and things like that. Right. And, um, it, it started at kind of the, the, the most expensive parts of the market. I think the 10 million, $5 million home, and it's starting to work its way down. And now, you know, what's getting hit is really like the 700K plus homes. 
The next to get hit is those, you know, let's call it the 450K to like 650K homes. And then even under the 450K homes will start to get hit at some point in time, especially if you're talking about unemployment going up in a major way uh, or anything like that happening out there. So it's a process. It's a process that has to be worked through. Hope you guys enjoyed this as always. I appreciate everybody for joining me. And do remember for my stock market people out there, the real estate market could take years to bottom after the stock market. Do keep that in mind. Some stocks have already bottomed in the market and are already, uh, you know, going to continue to uptrend. Meanwhile, the real estate market could easily get worse for the next one to two years. Doesn't mean stocks are going to get worse or the market's going to get worse or certain stocks are going to get worse. Like it just means there's more pain ahead in, in that specific space. Um, the stock market plays this game out way in the future. And uh, if you're wondering why you saw stocks go down 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, some 90 percent, right? They're playing in the future. They're playing a futures game. And um, if you're playing this futures game, I don't think it adds up too well for real estate. Much love as always, guys. I appreciate you joining me. 17,700 plus subscribers strong on this channel at this point in time. Thank you, everybody that's here. Appreciate you and have a great day.